welcome to everyone who's here. Uh, I'm Linda Molano. I'm a member of the Wednesday Diocese of Davenport uh, Social Action Group, also a social action group at my parish of St. Paul the Apostle and an uh, interfaith group on attacking trafficking. I'm delighted to introduce you to my friend Connie, Connie Mutel. I first met her in connection with Our Lady of the Prairie near Wheatland, Iowa. It's a wonderful retreat center sponsored by a sponsored ministry by the Congregation of the Humility of Mary. And if you've never been there, please go. It's one of the most beautiful, peaceful places in the world. For a while, we were both on the uh, advisory committee for Our Lady of the Prairie. But I'll give you a little history of, of my experience with her books. When I first met her, her book was called A Sugar Creek Chronicle, Observing Climate Change from a Midwestern Woodland. And then before my husband and I made a pilgrimage to Western Iowa, Eastern Nebraska, I read her book, Fragile Giants, A Natural History of the Lus Hills. There are many other books, but particularly today, we're here to talk about her newest one, Tending Iowa's Land, Pathways to a Sustainable Future. It's an edited book, which means that Connie's not the only writer, but she has chosen other writers with expertise on Iowa's soil, water, air, and life, diversity or lack thereof, who have also told their personal stories. And think I've heard her talk about the book before and thinking about it, it's, it's as though she is the conductor of the book and she has also composed the outline of its message. So I give you my, my friend, Connie. Thank you. Well, that's, that's a good, I like that conductor of the book and also creating the um, outline. I wish I had thought of that when I started the book because <laughs> I wasn't too sure what I was doing. A couple of you have heard me talk about this, Lee has and Linda. Um, so forgive me if I repeat myself, but um, I'd like to start with a prayer uh, from Pope Francis from his Laudato Si. I'm going to have to go fast, so I'm going to try to cut corners where I can. So this is a prayer from for the earth. It's it's at the very end of the Laudato Si. All poor, all powerful God, you are present in the whole universe and in the smallest of your creatures. You embrace with your tenderness all that exists. Pour out upon us the power of your love that we may protect life and beauty. Fill us with peace that we may live as brothers and sisters, harming no one. Teach us to discover the worth of each thing, to be filled with awe and contemplation to recognize that we are profoundly united with every creature. As we journey toward your infinite light, we thank you for being with us each day. Encourage us, we pray, in our struggle for justice, love, and peace. Amen. So um, Linda and I are friends, and I consider her a good friend, although I don't get to see her nearly often enough at all. Um, but thank you, Linda, for inviting me. And this is a book about change. It's about change that we perceive and change that we ignore, change that's fast, change that's slow, change that is earth shattering and that's incremental, change that is capable of altering the history of life on earth. These are the changes that are now increasingly dominating Iowa's landscapes. And these are what I'm going to be talking about today. Because we do have limited time, I'm going to give a, pre, a really uh, kind of skin and bones uh, version of what Lee heard in three hours at the Prairie um, Retreat last weekend. Um, but in general, this book will focus on this new book, Tending Iowa's Land. And it will be a small shot, snap, snapshot of what's in the book. So I'd like to start by telling you a little bit about my changes in my life and what's happened to me. I'm an ecologist and a, back, a, a botanist by training. I've been writing since I was in graduate school back at, at, in Colorado and then came with my husband to the University of Iowa. Um, and in my career here had, over 40 years has been uh, a diversity of science writing and editing over the years. But I'm most proud of what I consider my books on Iowa history and natural history. 
I call them my Iowa series. <laughs> there are six of them now, so I figured I could call them that. When I wrote the first of these Iowa books, that's this, this one that um, Linda referred to, Fragile Giants and Natural History of the Lust Hills. I thought, um, I'm an ecologist. I thought, well, the world is so wonderful and wondrous. Um, all I have to do is write about what's in the world and people will get so excited about it that they'll want to preserve and restore the natural world. And that's the way I wrote. It was pretty much a straight, it was a nicely written, but just pure, pure descriptive science, what's in the Lost Hills. Um, and I assumed that that would bring positive changes. And actually it did bring some positive changes in the Lost Hills. Um, and I, I continued doing that type of writing for many years. Um, in 2008, I had a book that's the natural history of the whole state. It's called The Emerald Horizon, The History of Nature in mm -hmm. Iowa. And that book was published just 15 years ago. It makes amazes me. It barely even mentions climate change. I think that maybe there's one phrase in it in the whole book. Again, this book was written thinking that all I had to do was ex explain nature to people. They would fall in love with nature and restore, restore uh, nature. And then we'd all be better off because we would get all of what we call the ecosystem services, these benefits that nature provide. Things like decomposing our waste. What would we ever do without nature's decomposition? Or making soils that feed us or pollinating the crops that, um, that, that we depend upon for our food system. Pretty much descriptive science. The thing is, I, this book was published in March of 2008. Two months later, two months later, we had what was then the largest flood ever to hit Iowa that we knew of in historic times in any way. And people were at the university were stunned. They were shocked. And I was asked, approached and asked that somebody said, could you, would you consider doing a book on, on these Iowa floods um, for the University of Iowa Press. And, and so I did that. This was an edited book and it went together really fast because a lot of people at the University of Iowa were doing research on that flood. And 2000 years, 2000, 2000 years, 2000, two years later in 2010, this book came out, A Watershed Year, Anatomy of the Iowa Floods of 2008. So I thought, okay, that's done. Got that done. Um, you know, it was again straight, straight science. Not very much creative writing in there at all. Then that same year to, that that was published, 2010, I was asked to uh, put together, edit a report for the state legislature on um, climate change, the impacts of climate change in Iowa, which was published in 2011. I'm telling you all of this because it wasn't until I sat in a year's worth of meetings with Iowa's uh, climate scientists from all three of the region's institutions, it wasn't until I did that, I'd been writing this stuff for decades, that I finally realized that we are on the verge of massive changes here in Iowa. Climate change is huge, it is huge. It's a threat to civilization and to humanity, but, um, I had never, you know, it, I kind of read it and it was science, but it just never sunk in. And I thought, okay, this is what's happening to everybody. By that time already, the scientists were saying, we've been writing about climate change since, you know, 1989, 1990, before that even. Um, but nobody's reading our books. Nobody's reading the science books. Nobody's, they, they say they don't believe in climate change, but we're not asking them, it's not a faith system. We're not asking them to have faith in climate change. We're asking them to look at the facts and consider appropriate ways to deal with this problem. So I did a couple years worth of thinking about how could I write a book that people would read about climate change and that would get through, you know, get through this kind of thick shell that we have of thinking that everything in the world is basically fine and we're going to do fine and we don't really have to take care of those big problems, um, you know, do a little bit here and there, but we don't have to really wor worry about them that much. And what I discovered in all of my reading was that what we needed to do was to use creative writing techniques, which I knew about. I, I also have written essays for many years. I knew how to write essays, first-person essays. 
where I put myself out there, I write what I'm doing, what I'm thinking, what I'm believing in my local area. And I tell stories about it. I knew how to do that. And finally, I said, okay, this is what I need to do with the science writing I'm doing. They're not two different worlds. And I wrote this book, which was published in 2016. This is the book that Linda was mentioning, A Sugar Creek Chronicle, Observing Climate Change from a Midwestern Woodland. And you can tell just by the title that this puts me into the story. I'm observing the climate change. I'm sitting in my woodland and looking out and, walk and watching what happens. And I tell first person stories. It's actually a memoir of my life. I trace parts, things that I have done and um, been involved with since the time I was a child. And it's also a one year nature journal. It's kind of an intricate structure. So just believe me, it works, but it doesn't sound, it sound that great from a distance. A one year nature journal, 2012, which I started writing in January in 2012. And sometimes, you know, I'm a Christian and I do a lot of praying about my reading and my about, about my writing. And sometimes I just think that there was some nudge that that um, God was giving me a kick in the rear to start writing in 2012, because that was the first year, the very first year that we ever saw the impacts of climate change affecting us. Before that, we had things, you know, things happening, a big, big rainfall here and there, but, you know, maybe kind of weird temperatures in the middle of winter. But 2012, it just went to hell. Everything went to hell. That was the year of Hurricane Sandy in New York, which was the biggest, the most impactful that we've had. It was the year of weird temperatures in the wrong season, many, many things. And I was there writing a journal, a nature journal about what was happening, how the species were reacting, how the frogs started to, to sing, you know, in December instead of in March. And the flowers we were seeing, I was seeing that year in November, I was seeing um, spring wildflowers start to bloom because of the heat, really weird stuff. So that was my book, Sugar Creek Chronicle. Um, mostly stories about my life in the woods, mostly stories about my past, but the underlying message was always, look at what's happening here. The climate is changing, it's caused by people. This is what we're doing. This is what we have to do differently. And that book changed me. It changed the way I wrote forever. And it changed anything that I will write in coming years. And it got, it, it's interesting because that book got a totally different response from a totally different audience than I had ever had read my information before. So that's the way I've changed. And I, I, I do wanna read, tell you today about this book, Tending Iowa's Land, who, which is, has 28 authors. Um, it's a book I edited, but all of those authors, most of whom are uh, you know, PhD university scientists who never have written in the first person in their lives, most of those um, did a beautiful job of telling their stories about their science in the first person. And it makes the book actually much more powerful. So another story I wanna tell you is how over this time period, since that book Emerald Horizon came out, I started giving talks. I've given, I will say hundreds, I'm sure it's hundreds of, of talks across Iowa, talks about um, our natural ecosystems, restoration ecology, what climate change is doing, a few about water, but more about just the natural ecosystems and climate change. And I've been doing them for many years. And throughout those years, I, I developed a sense of the history of Iowa's land changes, which are basically agriculture, just because agriculture affects most of our land. And I kept adding adding different levels to it. Okay, well, here's the history of transportation. How did that feed into it? Here's the history of uh, introduced plants. How did that feed into um, the history of Iowa's uh, agriculture in the state? And how did that change our environmental problems? And I got to the point where I had, I think, a, a sense of Iowa's um, evolution, the evolution of Iowa in the last 200 years, 1833, which is when we first developed the land, to the present, almost 200 years. What has happened when 
and what it's done to nature in Iowa. And I thought there are very few people who have this total picture. And I was giving talks on it, but I didn't have it down in writing. So I thought, okay, I'm gonna get this down somehow. And somehow this all came together during COVID when I needed something to work on, something to kind of chew on when I was locked up in our house here. And um, I started to do this book tending I was land uh, about two and a half years ago, and it's it's now just recently been published. So that's the story of why I did this book and a little bit of why I wrote it the way or why I did the did the book the way I did it. What I wanted when I started this book is I wanted a book that again, I knew I was going to edit because this is looking in depth at things like, soil development and erosion history and um, oh, climate change and agriculture kind of sub, sub, sub subjects that I'm not an expert in. So I knew I had to get other scientists to chip in. I wanted a book that was honest, that told what I view as the truth, which for me is science. I'm a trained scientist, so that's what I do, that's what I know. I wanted a book that was Iowa focused. I was sick and tired of hearing people in um, in environmental studies and environmental sciences classes who said, um, you know, we try to teach about climate change. We try to teach about soil development and stuff. And we don't have any Iowa resources. We talk about climate change in Bangladesh and soil development in Wisconsin or something like that. I said, what we need is a, a book that looks at Iowa for Iowans. I wanted it to be a good read, accessible. And I wanted it to be positive because I've gotten, been thoroughly trained in the fact that if we just depress, if I depress readers by what I write, I have done more uh, more harm probably than good. I wanted a book that fed hope and fueled action, fueled activism. <clears throat> and I think that, that this book has fulfilled that desire. So let's look specifically at the book, Tending Iowa's Land, Pathways to a Sustainable Future. What is it? It's the first book to look comprehensively at the history of Iowa's natural environment, at its current condition and problems, at its predicted future, and at, at the solutions that we have for our problems. It has four sections, one on each of the major entities or, or yeah, entities that, that um, are, develop, are having problems that are intensifying, our soils, our water, our climate, our climate change, and the loss of biodiversity of native species here in Iowa. It's science-based. Um, it pertains well beyond Iowa. It's really a book about the Corn Belt, but the examples are all for Iowa, for Iowans, written by 21 Iowa, 28 Iowa scientists who were trained by me, they would say forced by me, to use storytelling, first-person storytelling techniques. They had short chapters, um, they were asked to give facts about problems, but not to overload the chapters. They were short, just pick out the most important points, because I wanted the chapters, again, to be accessible and enjoyable. And I wanted it to be a hopeful book with a positive bend. The authors all were asked to include solutions to the problems that they were talking about. They couldn't hand in their chapters until they had at least one or two solutions. And then the other thing I did was in each of the four sections, there were four science chapters in each section. The fourth section, chapter in each section is called a vision for the future. And these were written by four very special people, I think, that who were capable of saying, okay, here are our problems. Where do we want to be in 25 years? Where do we want to be in 50 years? And how are we going to get there? And they wrote a chapter which was a vision for our future because I think we can be well-meaning, we can have hope, we can be active, but if we don't know where we're going, we're gonna flounder around. So these authors painted a picture of where Iowa could be by say 2050, if we did things right. So it also, the book also has essays, and these are stories by people who are describing safeguarding our land every single day. They're stories by regenerative farmers, land restorationists, wildlife restorationists, other activists. These essays, which are shorter than the science chapters, are really fun to read. And they keep the book positive, a little bit lighter and action oriented. 
So I think, and I've actually been told by people, people who've read the book that it's a good read, an enjoyable read for, for the general public. And it's also meets the standards of being an introductory text for environmental science and studies classes. It's a, a science-based Iowa primer on what we need to do here in our state. It's easily found if you're interested in getting a copy, you can order it from several senses, um, sources on the web, if not um, getting it at your local bookstore. So what is the story then of Iowa's environmental problems? In order to understand them, I think we have to look back and see what Iowa was like 200 years ago in the early 1800s. And I'm gonna read just a tiny, tiny bit um, from the introductory chapter that I wrote here in the book. Um, and I'd, I'd like you to just kind of relax and try to picture this description. I tried to describe Iowa's prairies just before they got developed. The, duns, the dawn sun lay low on the eastern horizon, a golden globe spreading light and heat across the dew-laden tall grass prairies. All 28.6 million acres of the almost 36 million acres of future Iowa. Breezes set flowers and grasses in motion. Birds, beetles, and flies started their nectaring that would ensure flower pollination and seed production. Bobolinks, dick sizzles, horned larks sang on the wing. Prairie chickens nested everywhere in the thick grass. Gray wolves followed loose clumps of roaming elk and bison. Where wetlands prevailed, clusters, clusters of shorebirds whirled over nesting ducks and geese. Even whooping cranes and sandhill cranes joined the throng. Both of these birds at one, one time nested here in Iowa. Um, and then I go on in that section to describe what the prairie did, but I'll talk about that a little bit later, how the prairies protected the soils, formed the soils, protected the water, gave life to millions of species. So what was I want before, uh, before uh, people like me and my, my ancestors came? Well, it was one of the most diverse, self-sustaining, self-regulating -re ecosystems on the planet. It was ultimately sustainable. 80% of Iowa was covered by the tall grass prairie, which had amazing biodiversity, the most diverse ecosystems in North America, a thousand species of vascular plants, huge assemblages of mammals and birds, passenger pigeons flying over in flocks of billions of birds the most abundant land bird um, in, on the earth. Grasses were tall enough to hide herds of cattle. They covered and protected the soil year round. Each species was guaranteed life in perpetuity. Each species represented the ultimate in sustainability, including the humans who had occupied Iowa then for thousands of years, the native people. The interactions of diverse States, diverse species enabled proliferation of life and made life possible for or, all organisms. Life, human life, cannot exist without such healthy functioning ecosystems. Even now today, when we are so uh, convinced that we are in charge of governing the earth, actually, if the earth's um, ecosystem services do, are not functioning, if we're, if, they're not, if we're not cycling the water around the globe that we need to, decomposing our wastes, um, forming new soils and the like, uh, the human species will falter. The richness of the Iowa prairies began 10,000 years ago when the prairie species migrated back into Iowa after the um, recession of the last glacier. Um, the soils are called Iowa's black gold. These soils that the first Euro-American settlers found were the most, the, the most fertile, the most productive soils on the planet. We had them right here in Iowa, one quarter of the earth's richest soils, topsoils, were located here in Iowa. Iowa was an incredible treasure trove of natural resources. They had been formed over thousands of years by the wind deposited silt rich in micronutrients 
and the dense, deep roots of prairie plants. The soils were home to 100,000 kinds of organisms, well more diversity than was above the ground. Each year, the soils grew deeper and richer in organic matter, and the prairies developed during a period that had pre remarkably predictable climate and a stable sea level that allowed the de development of human civilization. So while the prairies were growing here, with a relatively few people enjoying them, the rest of the world was developing uh, boats, um, large cities on the oceans, on the rivers, starting to transport goods around the world, transport diseases around the world. All of those things were happening. And all of that development of civilization was dependent on the stable clim climate that we've had for 10,000 years. All of this started to flip when, the, when Iowa was transformed starting in 1833 with the import of agricultural techniques from, Europe, from the Eastern states and from Europe and Asia. Within one generation, 1833 to 1900, the prairie landscape was plowed, flipped from one of the most sustainable landscapes on the planet to one of the most intensively used and least resilient landscapes on earth. That's where we are now. If you look at the challenges and problems that define Iowa today and that are described in the book, Tending Iowa's Land, the major problems are loss and degradation of our topsoil. We've gone from about average topsoil of 16 inches to um, average, average across the state to six to eight inches of topsoil. We've lost about half of it. And in many places, we're down to topsoils that are only one to two inches deep. The topsoils that remain have declined in soil health. That means declined in organic matter, living organisms, and the like. Water flow and quality has, de has uh, declined as well. We have more floods now, and they are more, um, they're more intense than before. And we have, intense, we have pollution of the surface waters that give us the worst water quality in the nation. In terms of climate change, which is caused by primarily by the release of carbon dioxide, primarily from the fossil fuels, this is affecting Iowa now. I'll talk a little bit more about that. But we know the one thing that's, that's going to happen is that this climate change will have more and more of an effect on Iowa's natural processes. And we have a, a great loss of our native, original native biological diversity here. Iowa has been uh, acknowledged to be the most highly transformed state in the United States. We have lost more nature, more ecosystem services than any other state. In summary, we've traded sustainability that we had 200 years ago for short-term gain, for economic gain. And that, you may argue that that's good or bad, but the, the bottom line is that in the long run, it won't work because a non-sustainable system means one that's going to be used up. So I'd like to say that these, these changes are largely the result of agricultural transformation. But, and, and people say that the, the transformation of Iowa started with the first cut of the plow through our prairies. But I want to make clear that I am identifying agriculture, agricultural processes or uh, practices, but I'm really not condemning them. I, to, to, for me to do that would be entirely fickle because I came from um, a family of German immigrants that came and farmed the soil. And I wouldn't be here today if they hadn't done that successfully. We're all here today because of I, the Midwestern agriculture. The settlers who did that agriculture did not see the future and didn't see, they had no way of seeing the problems that we have today. The thing that I'd like to say is that today we can see what are the results of our intense agriculture and lack of attention to caring for water pollution and the like. We've pushed the problems too far. We can see that we need to return balance to the world or to, to the land, to Iowa's land in order to make agriculture 
and nature both sustainable again. And that's what this book uh, proposes doing, making both of those sustainable. So let's look at how this happened. I'm only going to be able to give you one or two examples because of time constraints. And what I want to do is look at water, what's happened to water in Iowa. Um, but if we look at water, we have to consider soil at the same time, because originally, 200 years ago, soil was married to the water, and the water was married to the soil. Soil totally governed water's flow uh, in pre-settlement times. The soil, these, these thick, rich topsoils, Iowa topsoil, 16 inches average in depth, were half air pockets. So they, I call them fluffy. If you had an eight inch rain on an Iowa prairie soil that was 16 inches deep, and that topsoil had eight in, the equivalent of eight inches of air pockets, that prairie could have absorbed completely an eight inch rain in one day. And once the, the water got down into that prairie soil, it was held there by the soil and by the abundant organic matter that comprised the, uh, the prairie soils. Both the organic matter and the air pockets soaked up and held Iowa's water and then produced very slow flows, not over the surface of the soil, but through the soil so that the water flowing through the soil was being cleansed as it flowed. And it flowed very slowly until it was reduced in, in bottomland swales. This is called an infiltration hydrology. And it was one of the secrets that made Iowa's prairies so stable and so wonderful. That slow movement of water through the soils, not over the surface of the land. Because of that uh, motion over the surface, um, we didn't have soil erosion because there wasn't any soil that the soil was being held by the prairies and by the prairie or this organic matters in the soil so that we didn't have soil uh, going into the rivers down below and the water was was moving very slowly in any case so this infiltration hydrology fostered biodiversity both under the ground ground and above the ground because um, the prairies had tremendous uh, tremendous, um, I think it was either 20 or 30 percent of Iowa was covered by wetlands, and these wetlands were homes to many, many um, waterfowl that nested there and lived there. So the soils, as I said, would moderate flooding because the water didn't come out in gushes. We didn't have flash floods like we have today. And the, the, so, the um, soils would, would moderate also or control the pollution of water, and water would bring life to the prairies because all the species living in the prairies needed that, that needed the water, needed the moisture to live. So what changes were made to change this very sustainable intact system? Well, the first one of the first things that the, that the settlers did is they looked at the landscape and they realized that parts of it were too wet to farm. And so they started immediately a purposeful dewatering of the landscape. I can show you maps from Johnson County where within 10 years, the Iowa River was being rechanneled, um, put into a different channel to rush the water off of the land so that the land would dry up and could be farmed better and more rapidly. So channelized rivers and streams, draining of wetlands was a big thing um, all through the 18th century, the 1900s, which would have been at the 20th century. Right? No, through the 1800s, the 19th century, that wetlands were being drained. And then the tiling, the tiling of our farmland started in the 1870s. Already in the 1870s, uh, people were inserting clay tiles, especially in um, the flatlands in mid-central Iowa, uh, north-central Iowa that are so flat to, to dry up that land. The tiling of our Iowa's farmland goes on today. You can see it driving down the, insul the interstate. And with these, all of these actions, what people were doing was trying to get the water to leave the soil rapidly. And they did that by changing the infiltration 
uh, hydrology to surface water flows. And as soon as you get surface water flows, you start getting erosion of soil and also erosion of creek beds and also water pollution because the water that is washing over the soils rapidly um, carries soil particles as well as animal manure and, and the like down into the bottomlands. So from the 1900s onward, we had intensification, especially from the 1950s onward, intensification of agriculture. We now have most of Iowa, as you know, the majority of Iowa being covered by two crops. These are crops that cover the soil less than half a year. They're not perennials, they're annuals that leave the soil um, open to, to erosion, open to uh, creating pollution and open to oxidation, the, the organic matter in the soils gets oxidized and goes into the um, air, adding to pollution, uh, to climate change. And um, we have added since the 1950s, a number of water pollutants to agriculture and to the soils, chemical fertilizers, pesticides, chemicals or um, antibiotics that we feed the livestock, um, growth hormones, all of these, uh, chemicals, these synthetic chemicals have been added to the surface water flow off of our agricultural land, um, as have the manure from these confined animal feeding operations, um, large amounts of manure. So that, that's what has formed the incredible pollution, water pollution we now have. And now since the 1980s, um, due to climate change, in the last 30 to 40 years, the precipitation in Iowa has increased from about 30 to 36 inches per year. This is an incredible increase that people just don't realize. 30 to 36 inches average each year. Why is that? Well, it's because the atmosphere in Iowa is hotter. It's only one degree hotter. The average at temperature rise in the world is two degrees Fahrenheit. But in most of that heat is in the Arctic and in Iowa we have a temperature average rise of one degree Fahrenheit. That's enough to increase the atmospheric humidity that we have in our air, which increases the intensity of rains, especially in spring. And the, the more numerous and more intense rains that we have now on average, along with the intense winds, we sure know this last week about the intense winds we have now here, we have more erosion, more flooding, and more water pollution. So those are three of our really big problems. Started to be created back in the 1800s with the plowing of the prairie, were intensified with our transition to a corn and beans agriculture. And then with climate change have been put, as I like to say, put on steroids and are magnified. All of those problems were originally controlled by the inter infiltration hydrology. Um, I was going to also talk, oh, I'm, I'm just going to go over the solutions in that we have in the book. These are in the um, sections in the chapters on soil or the sections on soil and sections on water. They propose multiple ways of dealing with these problems. Um, one thing I'd like to stress is that we know how to deal with all these problems. If somebody said, tell me how to, how to uh, deal with the problems with, uh, with Iowa's water pollution and erosion and um, soil degradation, somebody could sit down and do it right now. It, the, people have written a lot of articles on this, books on this. The thing is not that we don't have the solutions, that we just don't have the political will to do them. And that is a huge problem in itself. But in any case, this book talks about regenerative agriculture. And I don't know if you know what that means. It's agriculture that is aimed at rebuilding rich, deep soils. Rather than degrading, continuing to degrade the soils, the soils are encouraged to come back as uh, living, complex, organically rich soils. And re regenerative farming, um, includes techniques such as keeping the soils covered with living roots year round, decreasing tillage, increasing cover crops, putting livestock back on the land, diversifying plantings, 
planting fragile areas that are very prone to, to um, erosion in perennials and the like. The other big thing that is promoted in this book is changes in land use approaches. Um, and one of the authors writes about having a water-centered approach that fits the land use to the landform. And what he's talking about there is taking things like the land, the floodplains, and saying it's just it doesn't make sense to have housing or crops in the floodplains. We need to make room for rivers to flood. That's what the floodplains are meant to do. They can become re recreational land that would increase quality of life in Iowa. They can become pasture. They can become habitat for nature that would help solve our loss of biodiversity. And all of these problems could be um, approached and, and dealt with by returning biodiversity to floodplains and to especially flood prone lands. So um, these are examples of two of the book's major themes. One of them is that we need to reunite agriculture and nature for the benefit of both. And we know how to do that again, to get nature back into the, into the landscape. And that all the problems are interrelated. So if we have, for example, if I have an erosion problem um, down in the base of our land right here, which we did have a few years ago, um, that erosion problem uh, caused problems with the biodiversity because a lot of the native plants were washing into the gully that was being formed down there. The erosion um, added to the pollution that was being added to the uh, Coralville Reservoir and the like. But the, the thing that's so neat about this book and about the uh, solutions that are proposed is this. Every time we solve one problem, we solve all the other problems at the same time. So what we did is we reshaped the earth somewhat where we were having this erosion. And I planted a deep rooted prairie there, which increases biodiversity down there. It increases the um, habitat for a lot of animals and insects and the like. It um, decreases the amount of um, oxidation and carbon dioxide that's being added to the air. It helps address water pollution. It helps form more soil. Every single problem that uh, is I, I define as developing in this book has been addressed by planting that prairie on our land. So I was going to talk a little bit about biodiversity loss, but I think unless we have some time at the end, I'm going to cut this um, just because of time. Um, but these, these are the kinds of problems that are discussed in this book, and the interrelationships are um, described. And the thing that I'd like to say is that, um, you know, I know that it's hard to talk to other people sometimes about these problems. Many people don't see them, see the problems as problems. I didn't until I had written a couple books about them and really learned a lot more. But once you realize what's going on here, I'd like to summarize the way I feel now and what I see. These problems are real. They have been well documented. Every, book, every problem in this book has been well documented by scientific research. They're happening now in Iowa. They're getting worse in the last couple decades. Several are reaching tipping points. A tipping point is when something flips, something that was controllable flips into something that's uncontrollable. Right now, in terms of climate change, there are signs that the Greenland ice sheet is at the verge of reaching a tipping point that, so that the entire ice sheet over the next maybe couple hundred years will be melting. If the Greenland ice sheet melts, that will add 20 feet average sea level rise around the world. So this tipping point is at the point where the, the melt is so voluminous that there's no way it can be stopped anymore. And we all of these problems, loss of soils, pollution of water, they're all reaching tipping points. But again, as I said before, we know what to do about these problems. We just don't have the collective and political will. Current actions are ongoing, but they're inadequate for reducing the problems significantly. And these are truly unique times when human civilization and our species 
is at a risk. So then what about hope? Where do we find hope? Well, first I'd like to look again at the book, Tending Iowa's Land, because this book really is an upbeat book. And I think everybody who's talked to me about it has said that they felt more hopeful and they felt more upbeat after reading it. Many times the problems, instead of being problems, are seen as a challenge or an opportunity. The, the people, the readers, the authors here saw many, the multiple things that we could gain by addressing problems. The book stresses hope and it stresses solutions. These are sprinkled, the solutions are sprinkled throughout the book. The theme is very strong that these problems can worsen one another or they can heal one another. So if we just get in there and start working on one problem, we are going to address all of the other problems. Um, and the visions for the future are hope-filled and really quite creative and un unusual, I think. But we do know we have other hopeful realities as well outside of this book. Again, we know what to do about the problems. We just have to get going and do them. There are thousands of people around in Iowa who are working with a passion to solve these problems, including my authors who did their part by writing their chapters. And there's millions in the world who care passionately about nature and nature's services and the natural environment that are working to implement solutions. We can each make a difference. I like to say, Every single thing that we do, everything, either, again, thinking about climate change, either makes climate change a little worse or a little bit better. So every time we decide we're going to walk to the store or take a car to the store, we're deciding, are we going to use muscle power or fossil fuel power? You know, I mean, these are little things, but our food choices and the like, we have so many ways to act productively to lessen our negative impact on the environment. And I think that means that we all can, and indeed that we must act each in our own way and work the best that we can in, in our own ways. I, I work by writing and by using words, but other people have other things, other skills that they can apply. And we can accept that change is happening now and see that change is happening, good change, like renewable energy is a tremendous, tremendous, uh, thing that we should be proud of the wind tunnel, the wind towers that we have across the state, and the amount of energy that we renewable energy we produce here is really quite remarkable. But we really all have to keep a watch on politics and vote accordingly, and we have to watch for ways to bring economic jobs, benefits, and hope, as well as cleaner air, better health, and the like. And we can do this all as a package because if we work on things like air pollution, climate change. We improve the health of our people and um, our air in general. The other thing that I think um, is, you know, the solutions that we need to do, that we know now, we're going to end up doing them. We have to do them because as these problems are going to become more intense, especially climate change, we're going to be just grabbing for whatever we can do to lessen the climate change. And my question, the thing that I say is, it just doesn't make sense to not do them, do them now. I mean, if we're going to solve the problems, if we're gonna fl flip to a, a clean energy country, let's do it while it can still have an impact on our kids and a positive impact on the world for our kids and our grandkids. So what can everybody listening today, today do? Well, I think you can all think, first of all, accept the problems that are going on with our soils, our water, our air, and our biodiversity loss. Accept those problems and help us all to move beyond them. Increase your own awareness and your observations. That might um, mean getting a copy of the book, and um, reading the sections that especially interest you, maybe the whole thing, or sharing it with people, sharing if you have kids, share it with your ki uh, kids' teachers. Um, I know that it's already being used in one high school class, for example. Um, and just talk about, bring these problems out of the closet into the air. Take the problems seriously, talk about the issues, contact your legislators, act, 
um, work to generate bigger actions. I had one woman write me, which was so, so wonderful. Um, she was working up uh, in a city north of Iowa City, and she said that they are working on cleaning up their riverfront there and their floodplain. And she uh, copied some of the sections um, from the book about what to do with restoring floodplains and gave them to gave that to the legislators who were working on this whole thing and said, well, let's discuss these more. I mean, that was a simple, simple act, but a really powerful act, um, I think. And then let's all remember that each of us can make important changes if we want to and um, if we feel the need to. And I think that includes, includes our um, Christian responsibility as well. Our, um, our calling, what I think is a calling, to um, realize that uh, the earth and all the complexity of life on the earth is the uh, product of a creator that we pray to and that we worship and that we think. And that means if we, if we take the creator seriously, I think we have to take the creation seriously well as well. So um, we do have a little bit of time if somebody has questions or statements that you'd like to make. Thank you. This is Glenn Rage. One of the serious problems that we have is what do we do for the people within just our, our own diocese, the 22 counties of Southeast uh, Iowa that earn their living with hog confinements, monocrops, and so forth. What do we do to help those people who are going to be impacted by what needs to be done? There, just as uh, many uh, farriers, saddle makers, and so forth were put out of business with the automobile, uh, there's going to be a lot of people whose way of earning a living who will be impacted as we do what needs to be done. And, and I think part of the problem is finding what we can do to ease that transition for them. Mm -hmm. I hope that's not a question, is it? <laughs> <laughs> well, it is a question yeah. because we, we don't have any good answers at the moment. Yeah, yeah. Um, I don't know. I as much as as much as that, I'll tell you what I I get more concerned about is um, what's going to happen with the jobs that are are done away with because of robots. I mean, that's much a much larger number of people. And I keep thinking, is this, I don't know, does that make sense? Does it make sense to give jobs that are needed by people to machines? Where Where is the thought process with that? I, I don't know. Um, it, the thing is that I don't know if, I wouldn't say that, um, you know, if if you take people that are working in things like confinement buildings, if you switch to a a healthier system, um, would that reduce the number of jobs? I don't know what the numbers there are. I really don't. But I do know that the um, health effects, the respiratory health effects that are are from those coming from those confinement buildings are are um, They've been known for many years and, you know, so it's not the greatest place to work for your health in terms of your health. And the loss of diversity, even within the breeds of hogs, of course, makes it uh, much more likely that a disease will wipe out our hogs. Something yeah. like the African swine flu virus. Yeah. I, I think that if you had, um, my father was, my father has been gone now for 30 years, 40 years, wow. Um, but he was a very forward thinking person. And I remember him decades ago saying that um, he thought a lot about environment, he was a forester, thought a lot about environmental problems. He thought, he said, the only way we can really deal with environmental problems back then in the 60s is through a benevolent dictator. I don't know 
if that makes sense or not. But I do wonder, because we are having such a hard time getting reasonable measured uh, actions out um, and implemented. But I do think if we had a benevolent dictator coming coming here and taking over, I think one of the things that would happen is that we would have a lot of a, a huge number of jobs created in terms of restoring the landscape. And that would be a lot healthier than working with the with the hogs and those respiratory problems. A huge we have tremendous needs in terms of um, taking care of uh, of invasive species and um, tending tending native lands and getting um, get getting some of the lands getting fragile lands back to healthy growing situations again. So. You know, I think the jobs on the land are going to stay there. It's just where, what, what we pay people to do, which depends on gov government programs, right? I mean, that's the key. Well, yeah. thank you, Connie, for uh, attending this conversation today. And we're at the top of the hour. If you guys have any questions, you can email them to me, and I will forward to Connie, and you will get a follow up <laughs> with the link of the recording. Thank you. Have a good thank day. You. Thank you, everybody. Bye-bye. Thank you, Connie. Thank you. Thanks.